Hi there, I'm Alex Reed, and if you had told me a year ago that I'd be leaving Earth to move to Mars, I'd probably have laughed, spilled my coffee, and then gone back to correcting student papers on theoretical astrophysics. But here I am, strapped into a seat that feels like it's been borrowed from a medieval torture chamber, and I'm about to be hurled through space like a human cannonball. Space travel. It's not just science, it's also an extreme sport. The adventure started when I received the email, the kind that you assume must be a scam because it starts with, congratulations, you've been selected. I did what any sane person would do. I deleted it. Luckily, my colleague Lena Zhao, whose curiosity rivals that of a cat, retrieved it from digital oblivion and convinced me it was real. That email wasn't just a ticket to Mars. It was a one-way trip out of my midlife crisis. So, after bidding a tearful goodbye to my reliable old coffee machine, and yes, my family too, Lena, Marco Silva, a guy who can fix anything from a broken heart to a spaceship, and I found ourselves undergoing the kind of training that makes boot camp look like yoga retreat. Zero gravity training meant discovering that my stomach and I are not on speaking terms when flipped upside down. Who knew? The day before launch, we were paraded in front of the press, stuffed into spacesuits that must have been designed with lobsters in mind, because humans clearly weren't considered during the blueprint phase. I've had more comfortable dental appointments. As for the spaceship, Ares 5, it's a masterpiece of technology and a testament to human ingenuity. And it's supposed to be our home for the foreseeable future. I prefer to think of it as a high-tech tin can. During the press conference, I was asked how I felt about leaving Earth. Excited, I said, flashing my best imitation of an astronaut smile, the kind that says, I'm thrilled, really, even though I just signed up for potentially getting stranded on a lifeless planet. The morning of the launch was a blur. Strapped in, with the countdown echoing in the cabin, my heart was racing, my palms were sweaty, and Lena was reciting the laws of physics under her breath like they were calming mantras. Marco, on the other hand, looked like he was ready for a nap. As the final countdown hit zero and the engines roared to life, there really was no going back. Mars, here we come, ready or not. I just hope they have coffee there. Ladies and gentlemen, and potential Martians of the future, welcome to Mars Colony One, your not-so-tropical, extraordinarily dusty, and rather red holiday destination. I'm Alex Reed, your host for this once-in-a-lifetime adventure, because let's be honest, nobody does this twice. Landing on Mars wasn't quite the elegant ballet we hoped for. It was more like a galactic belly flop. But hey, we made it, and the first step outside the Ares Five was... Well, it was breathtaking. Literally. The Martian air is not exactly perfumed with the scent of roses. Thank goodness for oxygen tanks, right? Our new home, Mars Colony One, looked a bit like a child's building block set, if the child was slightly inattentive and had a fascination with geometric shapes. The base was all set up by our robotic pioneers, bless their metallic hearts. They did a fine job, though the decor could use a woman's touch. Or just any touch that doesn't resemble a tinfoil project. The initial days were filled with setting up our equipment, planting flags, because what's a new planet without a little ceremonial flag planting? And taking those iconic first selfies, Mars or bust. Meanwhile, Lena was practically skipping from rock to rock, collecting samples and mumbling scientific marvels about each one. Marco was tinkering with every gadget and rover like a kid with new toys during Christmas. Our most curious encounter came a few days in. Meet Flora, our unofficial Martian pet. It's this odd, plant-like thing that shuffles around and changes colors based on mood, or maybe based on weather. We're still figuring that part out. When I first saw it, I thought, great, even the plants move faster than I do here. Flora turned out to be a real social butterfly. It seemed to love the sound of Lena talking to it about geology and would glow an affectionate shade of blue. It turned a very disapproving red, however, when Marco tried to see how it responded to techno music. We're now keeping a daily log of our interactions with it. The Flora Diaries, Mars Edition. Between setting up the base and becoming amateur botanists, we also started to adapt to life here. You know, figuring out how to cook meals that aren't just tasty, but can also be eaten in a low-gravity environment without decorating the ceiling. We've all mastered the art of the slow-motion catch by now. So here we are, living the Martian dream. 
It's not every day you get to step out on a new planet and chase after alien plants. But then again, it's not every day you leave Earth behind either. Here's to hoping the excitement continues and that the next surprise is less about survival and more about discovery. Stay tuned, Earthlings. Your favorite Martian here, Alex Reed, coming to you not so live from the Red Planet. You know how people say life on Mars would be boring? Well, strap in, because it's about to get as spicy as your grandma's secret chili recipe. So there we were, playing house on Mars, fixing things, running tests, and chatting with Flora, our resident color-changing plant alien thing. It was just another ordinary day. Well, as ordinary as you can get millions of miles from Earth, when Lena stumbled upon something that would make Indiana Jones drop his whip in envy. During one of her geological escapades, which I lovingly call digging for space gold, Lena found what appeared to be a hatch. Yes, an actual hatch, buried under Martian soil. This wasn't on the brochure, folks. We gathered around like it was Black Friday, and the hatch was the last discounted TV. Now, here's where it gets Hollywood-worthy. Inside this hatch was an entire chamber, untouched, filled with artifacts and remnants of what clearly was a Martian Airbnb for ancient aliens. Just kidding, but seriously, it looked like Mars had visitors, or perhaps natives, long before we showed up to plant flags and take selfies. As Marco, Lena, and I ventured into this Martian mystery box, we found something incredible, a holographic projector. I kid you not, it started playing a message as if it had just been waiting for a dramatic reveal. This wasn't your typical movie night. It was a holographic history lesson from a lost civilization. The hologram showed us that Mars wasn't always the barren party town it is today. It was once lush and vibrant, with an advanced society that could travel the stars. They talked about their achievements, and here's the kicker, their downfall. Apparently, they managed to mess up their planet to the point of no return. Sound familiar? Here we were, thinking we were the pioneers, the first to make Mars our home, but really, we were just the latest in a long line of cosmic tenants. The ancient Martians left a warning, a sort of cosmic caution tape. Take care of your planet, or you'll end up shopping for a new one, just like we did. So there we were, standing in a room full of ancient warnings, feeling like someone had just told us the end of a movie we just started watching. Lena was buzzing with excitement, scribbling notes faster than I could make sarcastic comments. Marco was already figuring out how to integrate ancient Martian tech with his Spotify playlist. The revelation was mind-blowing, literally history-altering. We had come looking for rocks and ended up finding a treasure trove of cosmic secrets. Just another day at the office, right? So, what do we do with this newfound knowledge? Stay tuned, because we're just getting started on rewriting the history books. Well, hello again from your favorite space dweller, Alex Reed. You know, when I signed up for this Mars gig, I was under the impression that extreme weather meant deciding whether to wear two or three thermal layers while bouncing around the Martian surface. Turns out, Mars has a little more up its sleeve, like dust storm galore. It all started on what I'd argue was a pretty good Mars morning. You know, the kind where your coffee rehydrates correctly, and your best alien plant buddy, Flora, is glowing a happy shade of green. Then, out of nowhere, the sky turned a shade of rusty orange I hadn't seen since my first car, a lovely 1972 station wagon. Before we knew it, a Martian dust storm was upon us. And let me tell you, it makes Earth's hurricanes look like gentle spring breezes. Our lovely habitat, which Marco had affectionately started calling the tin can, was shaking like a maraca at a salsa dance. Visibility was zero. Communication with Earth was cut off. Turns out interplanetary calls don't go through so well during a Martian tempest, and our power started flickering like a haunted house light show. There we were, three humans and one alien plant, huddled in a habitat designed for milder weather, hoping Marco's duct tape fixes would hold. And that's when things got interesting. Remember the ancient Martian tech we discovered? Turns out it included some sort of emergency protocol. As the storm raged like a toddler in a toy store, this ancient system kicked in. Walls began to shift, and suddenly we found ourselves in a hidden chamber beneath our base. A panic room, but Martian style. Inside this bunker, Flora started doing something extraordinary. It wasn't just riding out the storm, it was absorbing energy from it, glowing brighter with every gust. 
it was like watching a live-action battery charging. Meanwhile, Marco was making notes to patent a storm-powered nightlight, and Lena was furiously documenting every scientific anomaly she could observe. We spent what felt like an eternity in that Martian bunker, listening to the howl of the wind above and marveling at our good fortune below. It was a bonding experience, the kind that makes you appreciate your crewmates, even when they've eaten the last packet of freeze-dried ice cream. Eventually, the storm passed, and we emerged from our ancient Martian hideout like groundhogs checking for shadows. The base was battered but standing, thanks to Martian engineering and a bit of human stubbornness. Re-establishing contact with Earth was like calling home after you've accidentally road-tripped to another country. Hi, Earth. It's us. We're okay. Yes, we did get caught in a storm. No, we didn't touch anything we weren't supposed to. Okay, maybe just a little. So there you have it, another chapter in The Martian's Guide to Gardening During Apocalyptic Weather. Tune in for our next adventure, hopefully less dust and more discovering. Hello once more from the red sands of Mars. It's your interplanetary narrator, Alex Reed, here to wrap up what has been nothing short of a cosmic roller coaster. Who knew that life on Mars would involve more drama than a soap opera at a family reunion? After our wild ride with the dust storm and our bunker hide and seek, we finally reestablished contact with Earth. You could almost hear the collective sigh of relief from two planets when we got through. I had half a mind to start the conversation with, you'll never believe what happened next, but figured NASA might not appreciate the suspense. Now, you might think after such a close call, we'd be packing our bags, kissing the Martian ground goodbye, and hitching the next ride home. But, oh no, not us. We're pioneers, remember? or perhaps just gluttons for extraterrestrial punishment, we decided to stay. Yes, you heard that right. Mars hasn't gotten rid of us yet. The decision wasn't made lightly. Between Marco's newfound hobby of Martian architecture, it's just like Lego, but the pieces are really, really heavy. Lena's scientific discoveries that could fill textbooks and my daily dialogues with Flora were now on a first color basis. We realized there's too much here to step away from. Plus, Let's be honest, the idea of being the first permanent residence of Mars has a certain appeal. Imagine the property values in a few centuries. We've started transforming our little habitat into a more permanent settlement. Marco is leading the charge on expanding our living quarters using Martian materials. Yes, we're literally building our house with Martian bricks. Lena has set up a research lab that would make any earthbound scientist green with envy. It's the only green thing around here, sadly. And Flora? Our delightful alien plant has become something of a local celebrity. It turns out Flora's species is quite vital to understanding the Martian ecosystem. They're like living, breathing, well, sort of solar panels that can help us with long-term sustainability on Mars. Who knew the key to living on Mars would be gardening? As for me, I've taken to writing down our experiences. Who knows, maybe one day there'll be a bookshelf here on Mars, and our little story will be there as a guide for future Martians. It'll be titled, How to Survive Mars, the Guidebook for the Optimistically Unprepared. So, as we look to the horizon, quite literally, since there's not much else in our view, I can't help but feel excited about what's to come. We've learned so much, and yet we've barely scratched the surface. Here's to new beginnings on Mars, where every day is an adventure. Every dust storm is a narrative twist, and every sunset is a reminder that we're part of something much bigger than ourselves. Stay tuned, Earth. Mars might just be the next big destination, and we're just getting started on making it home. Cheers from your favorite Martian.